Welcome everyone. This is Mary Duskwood, Director of Operations and Research here at Birchworks. Today, one of our senior executive recruiters, Kit Nordmark, will be answering your questions on marketing research and consumer insights careers. For those of you who aren't familiar with Birchworks, we're an executive recruiting firm specializing in fields like marketing research, analytics, and data science. Over the past several years, Birchworks Market Insights have been repeatedly mentioned in the press including in The Economist, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, CNBC, and The Chicago Tribune, among many others. And Birchworks has also been recognized by Forbes as one of America's best recruiting firms for several years, including newly this year in 2021. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Kit Nordmark. Kit started her career in the marketing research industry with a focus on qualitative research. She worked at True, a boutique insights firm specializing in youth, and more recently at the Futures Company, which is now operating as Kantar. At Birchworks, she focuses exclusively on research and insights roles, from junior associates up through senior leadership positions for both client and supplier side teams across the US. Before we dive into the Q&A portion, we wanted to share just a few pieces of data with you. We've been busy here at Birchworks doing our own research. We received a few questions about salaries from the registration page, so we wanted to give an overview of how salaries vary for research and insights positions depending on your job level. This data is from our 2020 Marketing Research Salary Study, where we segment salaries into five categories on the client side, the light blue bars at the top, and then another four categories on the supplier side, which are the dark blue bars at the bottom. Salaries can vary widely by region, educational background, and more. So for more information, I highly recommend downloading our most recent salary report, which is available for free at birchworks.com study. There's a lot of data in there, including quartiles, means, medians, and it should hopefully give you an idea of what salary range you might expect for your specific situation. The report has more data than we could hope to share with you today and still be able to get all, to all those wonderful questions. Throughout all of our conversations with research professionals over the past year, we've found that working from home and if, when, and how researchers may get back to the office remains a very hot topic. So we decided to reach out to our network to gauge their stance. Early this year, we surveyed researchers on whether they'd prefer working in the office or work from home. 72% said they prefer to work from home. We did find that these preferences can depend on someone's level of experience. Professionals who are very early in their career may be more likely to be drawn to the social cohesion and perks that appeal to younger professionals, seeing their work friends, free food, happy hours, et cetera not to mention ad hoc coaching and mentor opportunities. Whereas someone who is a bit more established in their career may favor more time at home and flexibility, or those with young families or school-aged children often appreciate flexible and remote work. When we asked if a hybrid model were offered, what do you think the optimal number of days in the office would be? The highest portion, 34%, said two days. Only 2% selected in the office five days a week, and only 6% said four days. Overall, more than 90% of professionals we asked said they'd prefer three days or fewer. The average was right around two days, so it will be interesting to see what the reality will be as more companies return to office life and whether more of them take advantage of flexible schedules or partial work from home options. We also sent out a survey asking professionals about work from home productivity. Out of a total of 341 respondents, we found that 71% of the sample believe that working from home is more productive than working in the office, while only 8% believe that working from home is less productive for them. When we asked about team productivity, we found that the largest segment of respondents, 50%, believe that their team is more productive while working from home. 15% of the sample believe that working from home is less productive, and 35% believe their team maintains the same productivity level. Overall, most professionals are more likely to feel work from home is more productive for themselves individually than for their teams. There are most likely a variety of reasons for the difference in results for personal versus team productivity. Working in the office can perhaps facilitate more conversation and team building, which can sometimes be more difficult when the team is working remotely. 
Communication and collaboration difficulties when working from home can be detrimental to team productivity. And team productivity may also relate to the team's function and how self-sufficient or collaborative the members' tasks are. Onboarding and remote training can also be more of a challenge when working remotely. And work from home doesn't allow for as many personal connections with colleagues or mentorship opportunities, especially ad hoc coaching, which being in the office typically encourages. While many professionals have adjusted to socializing with others on Zoom happy hours and other virtual gatherings, they may still find in-person collaboration and communication valuable, even if they consider work from home to be more or, as, or even as productive as the office. For those who are curious about the state of the research and insights hiring market in 2021, earlier this year, we surveyed hiring authorities to ask about their hiring plans for Q1 and Q2 this year. According to our respondents, which represented nearly 60 companies across the United States, we found that 64% of research and insights teams are planning to hire during the first half of 2021. 30% of teams are holding steady and 6% are cutting back. Right now, we're in a recovering economic climate and overall we are seeing hiring trends are starting to pick up quickly. There's a possibility that some of this hiring increase may still be attributed to filling empty roles after COVID-19 cutbacks. But for many of our conversations with research teams, many organizations had already resumed their hiring sometime last year. You can read more about the work from home and hiring surveys, as well as our other hiring market insights over on birchworks.com slash blog. And now back to our regularly scheduled programming, the Q&A. We've gathered lots of your questions from the registration page, but please feel free to continue sending any additional questions using the chat box on your screen. All right, Kit, we've got a number of questions around in-demand research and insights skills. So let's start right. off with the big one. What are the most in-demand <laughs> skills and what are the top requirements that recruiters are looking for? All right. Well, that's a good one to um, to kick us off. Um, I think when it comes to research and insights jobs, some of the, the top skills are kind of the first thing that comes out of a hiring manager or talent acquisition's mouth is really that expertise and working with data. And I feel like it varies so much just depending on the company and the role and the position. Um, it could be custom research, whether that's qualitative or quantitative. Um, syndicated research, sales data, social listening, it varies so much by the role, but generally, you know, that's the first thing that they're looking for is people who are, you know, kind of steeped in the marketing research and insights industry and have built those um, data focused skills already. Um, we also get requests for specific skill sets, um, depending on a certain position. So whether it's you know, certain methodologies, do they need someone who's worked with segmentation or large global research, innovation projects? Um, we've recently gotten quite a few requests for our customer experience or CX research. Um, so I think there can be focus areas too, and depending on the role, it could be something that's a CX specific role, and this person will be exclusively working on a, a major customer experience uh, program, or it could be one that kind of um, cherry picks some of those specific areas. So um, a lot of them do tend to fall towards specific um, expertise areas. Uh, and then I guess on top of that, like the technical side, then there's also um, soft skills that hiring managers are all, often looking for. So whether it is, um, you know, storytelling ability is often really key for researchers, um, people that can, you know, really take the data but understand what it all means and how to translate that back to business problems. Um, uncovering actionable insight. So not only, you know, figuring out what the data means, but what does that mean for the business? What does it mean for the brand, business decisions, and making sure that it's ultimately used to guide the strategy. Um, so that's a really important skill for researchers. Um, we also get quite a few requests for executive presence, and that can really be regardless of your um, tenure. So obviously, as you get more senior, it's important to be able to present, uh, you know, executive leadership and that kind of thing. But we have even started to see this as uh, being a pretty strong requirement for even more juniors in the field. Um, especially, you know, you could be on the supplier side and presenting to, I don't know, key leadership within your client's company. And so they want someone who, um, you know, not only has the research chops to do the project, but um, can present whether it's internal or external, but, um, you know, see that 
executive presence and, and really kind of communicate the research too. Um, and then I guess one other, one other thing that we also see is one of the most sought after backgrounds just in terms of research and insights role can be this hybrid background, um, which is kind of part supplier side, part client side. So oftentimes if you have a foundation and maybe have spent some time on the supplier side, you really understand how to conduct research kind of soup to nuts. So the nitty gritty of getting the work done, um, it's a little bit more hands on on that side often. So then, you know, if you have that under your belt, but then also have client side experience, so you're able to work within an organization, help drive those business decisions, work cross-functionally, um, that can kind of be, uh, I would say, like the holy grail just in terms of backgrounds that we see um, our clients looking for personally. Awesome. That was quite the comprehensive answer to a broad <laughs> question. So thank you so much, Kit. Um, the next question is about the client side versus supplier side. What's the day-to-day -day difference in a role for client side versus supplier side? Yeah, and it does. I mean, I feel like at the end of the day, the research that you're doing can be fairly consistent. Um, you're really trying to measure, you know, consumer behavior or sentiment or that kind of thing. It's just, it's kind of the way that it's conducted that varies. So, um, you know, if you're on the supplier side, if you're working in, you know, like an Ipsos or LRW, um, I would say one of the things that I, I hear from supplier side researchers, one of the things that I think they really love about it is oftentimes every day is super different. So you could be working with, I don't know, like a Coke or Pepsi on a new innovation project in the morning. And then later on that afternoon, you could be working with like Hulu or, or Nike, you know, a completely different category, different uh, projects, different company. I, I think that day-to-day -day difference, I think, is exciting for a lot of people. Um, and it's also more, I guess, hands-on with the, with the work. So a lot of times on the, um, on the supplier side, you know, you're designing the research, you're listening to, to client um, questions and business objectives and that kind of thing. You could be working with I don't know, CPG or retail, pharmaceuticals, kind of all across the board there. But regardless of the category, um, I think it's really about understanding the client needs, designing the research around it, um, partnering closely with them. And I feel like it is, you know, kind of that variety um, that people really do tend to like. Um, so on, I guess that's the supplier side. On the client side of things, you know, you're an in-house researcher. So um, I don't know, you'd be working with like the Coke or Pepsi or Nike, but instead of being an outside, you know, kind of external partner, this is when you're a researcher doing and, you know, gathering the insights in-house. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of the work tends to be fairly similar. It's just a little bit different the way it's done. So on, on a client side role, uh, you're likely partnering cross-functionally. You could be working with R&D or marketing teams or different departments within the organization. Um, and then really serving as, um, you know, kind of that liaison in between. So you could do the research um, DIY, do it in-house, um, kind of start to finish there, or you might partner with a company like an LRW. So, um, you know, you may not be as hands-on with the work, just depending on the organization and I guess how hands-on you want to be. Um, but at the end of the day, you're kind of using a lot of the same tools to answer those business questions. All right, awesome. Um, next, we're going to turn our focus to the more junior members of our audience. Um, what is your best advice for researchers just starting off in their careers? Yeah, I would say, I don't know, especially early on in your in your research career, I would say really just try your best to be a sponge. Um, I know it sounds funny, but a lot of researchers just kind of innately are curious people. So sometimes that happens naturally, but I think especially early on in your first couple of years out of school, sometimes it's really about, um, you know, trying to get exposure to as much as you can. So whether that's different methodologies, new tools and techniques, uh, totally different categories and industries, um, you know, I think a lot of that can be so valuable, especially when, when you're kind of junior. Um, and I think that's why a lot of people really love to start their careers on the supplier side, because you you can, um, you know, gain exposure to so many different things. Um, and I guess on top of the um, the tools and, and techniques and that kind of thing, also just learn from all your colleagues and teammates and whether they're on the insights team or whether they're in a different division. I feel like, you know, everyone brings 
their experiences to the table too. So sometimes just having that interaction within your company, you can pick up so much, um, you know, just knowledge and skill set and different ways to look at problems and, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I think the more diverse exposure you can get early on can help, you know, kind of build your broader research toolkit. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like great advice um, for, for anyone, really. Um, and then our final question for this section is um, marketing research versus data science. Uh, how do you see marketing research remaining relevant and collaborative with data science? And what skills can a, a research person add so that they're competitive? Okay, got it. And this is, this is one we get all the time, and I feel like it's near and dear to our hearts here because <laughs> virtually we cover, cover both areas. So, um, and I'm going to... I guess hold the skills question for now. So Mary, let me know if I forget to come back to that. Um, but I guess first we get this question a lot just around, you know, how does market research and insights exist within data and data science and all of the changes there. And um, it's something that we're always thinking about here too. And, and with recruiters that focus on data science and data engineering, I think we, um, you know, kind of have a pulse on both sides of things. Um, I think it's right now, I think it's, there's still definitely a place for both. And I think it's really the business collaboration that it, that is key here. Um, obviously, there's a ton of hype around big data and data science and analytics. I feel like we hear about it day in and day out. And, and rightly so, I feel like companies are swimming in more data than ever. And it's just expanding every day, basically. Um, but I think, you know, right now, we don't see those functions replacing research and insights anytime soon. I think what, what's happening is I think they're able to coexist. And so with all of the data available, I think if anything, it actually makes insights, you know, you can see more, even a broader, you know, 360 degree view, I'd say, of the consumer, of behavior, of what's happening. Um, so I think, you know, I see really, especially on like the client side of things, working with uh, almost hand in hand, leveraging the data science and analytics side of things, but also the insights piece too, because at the end of the day, it, you know, sometimes you really need the custom work to really get to the why, like why are consumers doing certain things or, um, you know, why is the, you know, results out of the data science team look like this, you know, sometimes you need to understand the consumer sentiment. Um, or I don't know, think about innovation research and new product development or concept testing. A lot of times there isn't existing data out there for something that isn't even on the market yet. Um, so I think there's definitely you know, a place for custom work to come in and kind of fill in those dots or help guide, guide businesses that way. So I think really they can, they can work hand in hand, but it is, it's definitely an area that we're keeping an eye on because they're, um, you know, we initially saw analytics and data science as very different roles and those have, somewhat blended. Um, but I think right now, you know, insights is still a unique spot. And a lot of times it is, you know, the, on the insight side of things, you need someone who can not only understand the data, but also connect the dots, who can translate it to directions for the business, who can, you know, present to executive leadership and, you know, kind of understand what to do with it. So uh, I think that's where insight folks come into play. All right, great. And then did you want to tackle the skills uh, portion of the question? Oh, got it. Okay. Yep. Thanks for the right. <laughs> um, well, I think that's an interesting one, too. And I think, you know, sometimes I talk to, you know, people who are looking for jobs out there and they, they say, well, you know what, all these, you know, postings that I see are looking for Python and Hadoop and I just don't have those skills. Um, I think the thing that's unique there is oftentimes some of the you know, hardcore data science roles that we work on here at Birchworks, those are oftentimes looking for people who have like a master's in stats or a PhD in computer engineering. You know, these are very technical backgrounds. The tools are changing fairly frequently and rapidly. So, um, you know, taking a, uh, I don't know, a Python bootcamp or something like that could be a nice to have, but it's not going to necessarily put you in a place where you can compete with people that do that for their job day in, day out, and they're modeling and working with unstructured data consistently. So what we're seeing are maybe some of the almost um, fringe tools like a Tableau or Power BI could be helpful, some of the visualizations. Um, we've seen some clients ask for, you know, maybe nice to have with experience with SQL or some of those. Um, so again, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about maybe picking those up, but it's not necessarily like a deal breaker at this point. So 
we're still keeping a pulse on that one though too because i think it is kind of an ever-changing conversation yes absolutely i think that's that's something we see here a lot at birchworks is that skills are always <laughs> evolving always keeping it fresh <laughs> yep all right let's move on to our next topic um, which is the job search process um, resume tips interview tips things like that we're going to start off again with a broad question that's on everybody's mind which is how has COVID changed the hiring process? Yeah, and that's like, you know, it's one of those things, I feel like there's a lot of questions just, you know, with the pandemic, everything we've dealt with over the past year. Um, and I think when COVID first started picking up last spring um, or spring 2020, you know, it really, everything went to a screeching halt, but then, you know, companies found ways around that. And what we saw is just really the entire hiring process going virtual. Um, and so I think initially we couldn't really wrap our heads around how that would work or how, you know, companies would bring people onto their team without meeting them in person. But I don't know. I think, you know, people have figured out workarounds and I think overall it's working really well. Um, it's, it's definitely changed the hiring process as a whole, though. Um, so I think one thing we've seen, especially on like the research and insight side of things, is oftentimes the process is taking longer. Um, and so uh, I don't know where it used to be, you know, back in the day pre-COVID, you'd often do a phone interview, maybe a second one, but then come in for an on-site. You might meet five or six people in one afternoon. Um, it was a little bit more confined. I think what we're seeing now is there's more steps to the process. Companies are maybe adding on steps as it goes along too. You know, if you have an interview and you meet with a hiring manager and then maybe a business partner, you know, if things go well, they might say, oh, you know what, we really want them to meet with, I don't know, <laughs> like the marketing team or, you know, add people onto the steps. So we're just seeing more steps in the process, added calls, that kind of thing. Um, I've also heard from a number of people and then also jobs that we're working on, even more um, prevalence of case studies, presentations. Um, and I think earlier where I mentioned that executive presence, I think sometimes that can be a little bit trickier to gauge over virtual interviews. So we're seeing more companies maybe do a case study or maybe have someone present some work, even if it's five or 10 slides, it's having a little bit of um, a glimpse into how this person might, you know, kind of operate in, in that avenue, I think goes a long way. So I guess if anything, we're just seeing that the process sometimes takes a little bit longer. Yeah, that's good to keep in mind for anyone that's uh, doing a job search right now. Um, yeah, and, and I then... guess on the flip side of that, oh, sorry. I'm just oh, say, go ahead. Is there any, any hiring managers out there? It's a good thing to consider. It's also a very active market. So if you are having someone go through a ton of different steps in the interview process and they're actively interviewing somewhere else, I don't know, sometimes it could be good to streamline just to potentially keep pace, because I know if, if you're adding on a ton of conversations, it can drag on a bit. So just a tip for anyone hiring out there. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, our next question uh, is about salary ranges. So how can you get a ballpark salary range for a position so you can see if it's even close uh, to matching your expectations? Oh, that's a good one. And that one is tricky. And I feel like we've seen the salary conversations have gotten trickier just, um, you know, with some of the salary laws out there and not being able to talk about it. Um, I think, I don't know, it's one of those things if you're working with a recruiter, which I know you aren't always, but whether it's, um, you know, a third party recruiter like Birchworks or an in-house recruiter at the company, I think sometimes that, that conversation can be had with the recruiter. They usually have a very good idea. Um, when it comes to, you know, if you're applying on your own online and all of a sudden you're in the interview process and, you know, it may not come up on the first call. Um, it's one of those things, maybe it'll come up on, on the next call, but you definitely want to have that conversation at some point. Um, so, you know, I would say if, if possible, talk to a recruiter. If not, maybe don't ask on the very first call, but maybe on the, the second one, if it comes up or, um, you know, getting an idea just to make sure it's, in the realm of what you're looking for, I think is important. So, um, you know, potentially bringing up with a hiring manager or someone along the way, I think is a good way if you don't have the recruiter um, kind of insight. Absolutely. Um, and then of course, another salary expectation question. This is always a big topic, I think. Uh, what is the best approach for answering a question about your own salary expectations, um, especially if they're doing an application or something that requires a numeric response? 
Got it. Okay. And I think that one is actually tricky too. And I think every, um, every application process is a little bit different. I think it's possible to give a range. And I know some don't allow you to, but it's one of those things. If you have kind of a range in mind, you know, providing like a 120 to 140 is almost better than putting 130 just because it shows that there's a little bit of wiggle room. Um, I know sometimes you don't have that, <laughs> that ability, but um, I think beyond that, and I think what the best way to start is to kind of wrap your head around that is to have an idea of um, your market value. So I think the most important thing is you don't want to shoot too high. So I don't know, say you're a research manager and you have eight years of experience, um, you know, you want to make sure you throw out a number that makes sense. So you kind of need to weigh where you'd like to be maybe where you are now or kind of what you think um, might make a nice next move. You don't want to throw out something in, you know, like the high hundreds if you think that your role might be more in like the, I don't know, 90 to 110 range. So I feel like the one thing you don't want to do is shoot too high because a lot of times that could um, almost signal to them that it's probably not the right level in terms of like where the company is looking to potentially place this role. Um, another thing that can be helpful is our salary study. And I know it sounds like a plug, but <laughs> it, it is a useful tool. Um, it breaks down salaries by, um, you know, supplier side, client side, different levels, um, tenure, that kind of thing. And so I think sometimes um, researchers struggle with knowing where they fall. And I feel like that can at least give you an idea um, and just, I don't know, kind of help kind of guide that decision process. So. Yeah, absolutely. We put a lot of work into those studies and we're very proud of them. And I, I, I like to plug them too. So thanks, Kit. Um, all right. Um, next, we're going to talk about resumes. Um, what is your best resume writing tips for insight positions? Got it. Okay. And there's, there's quite a few tips. And I feel like there's some that are kind of just high level on resumes overall. I feel like people always ask me, I don't know, do I, does my resume need to be one page? Um, so I guess before I get to like the marketing research side, maybe I'll just throw out a couple um, <laughs> high level tips. Um, and I think th just that length one, I think someone just asked me yesterday. So I think, you know, having your resume one page is great. Two pages is totally okay. I think what you don't want to do is have like a four page resume. People get kind of lost. Um, but I think especially if you're, I don't know, 10 plus years in your career, going on to a second page is totally fine. Um, I think one of the things you really want to do is make sure your resume is strategic um, instead of just looking tactical. Like you don't want your resume to look like it's the job description for the role. Um, <clears throat> you do want to tailor it to the position just because that can really help show that your experience aligns well with what the company is looking for. Um, but you really want to do show that, you know, not only that you did, I don't know, qualitative research to understand, I don't know, European markets as your I don't know, launching a new product, <laughs> you know, you might want to say, you know, X, Y, Z, maybe um, the research plan that you did, and then also uh, what you executed and what was the outcome. So saying that the research you did actually resulted in, you know, expanding to this new market and then targeting to two specific audiences or something like that. So again, just kind of showing that your work was strategic and showing the impact of, um, you know, your work on the business. I know that can be a little bit tricky when you're on um, the supplier side, just because oftentimes, you know, if you're working with another company and you hand off your report and present the, the findings at the end, you don't necessarily know what happens to it. Um, but I don't know, sometimes I, I, I used to be on the supplier side myself and I, you know, if, if possible, if you have a good relationship with the company, maybe send a quick note and see what became of the research or if it helps make any business decisions. I don't know, that can be a good way to, um, to kind of show the impact that your work had. Um, okay, I have to bring myself back in a little bit. <laughs> um, another thing specific for researchers is just using specific methodologies. So, um, you know, instead of mentioning you use quants and qual or syndicated research, you know, add a little bit more detail. So if you're working on brand development work or white space analyses or in context research or voice of the customer, um, panel, POS, you know, some of the specifics there, adding more detail onto your resume shows, you know, both that you're hands-on with different methodologies, but then also those can almost be used as keywords that recruiters are looking for. Um, 
So I recruit specifically in the space, so I kind of know what I'm looking for um, talking to researchers day in and day out. But sometimes, you know, talent acquisition or recruiters internally might also be recruiting for um, accounting roles or IT. And so, you know, having some specifics can almost, you know, be used as a checklist for your resume. Um, All right. Okay. This is some yeah. great tips, Kit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, uh, so the, along with resumes, I know we get a lot of um, questions about LinkedIn profiles. Um, how important is your LinkedIn profile? Do you have a couple of quick bits of advice on um, how to uh, make your, your profile shine? Yeah, I would say, you know, overall, I think LinkedIn is uh, an important, I guess, yeah, it's important. I feel like you want to make sure that you're, you're kind of using your LinkedIn and your resume um, in tandem. So I feel like a lot of times, you know, the resume is the first thing that people think about. Sometimes the LinkedIn might be an afterthought. Um, but I don't know, almost anyone, hiring manager, recruiters, anyone who's looking to fill an open role, I feel like they look at your resume, but then they also will pull up your LinkedIn just to get an idea. Um, you know, if, uh, you can show your personality a little bit or, um, you know, it just kind of brings your profile to life in a way. So I feel like you definitely want to make sure that you've given your LinkedIn um, attention. Um, I'd also add in detail. So sometimes I know people just put their title and kind of tenure in their different roles, but adding in some specifics around what your job was, the kind of, uh, you know, the role that you held, it almost wants to be somewhat of a mirror of your resume. It may not need quite as much detail, but, um, Essentially, a lot of recruiters also use LinkedIn to look for new candidates, too. So if you have specific, you know, like you worked on segmentation work or innovation or specific methodologies, sometimes that can help your name come up in polls um, as people are looking. So I think another reason why, why LinkedIn is, um, is kind of key to use, especially if you're actively in a job search. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, getting some insider tips from the recruiting industry from Kit. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So the the next couple questions we have are, are um, surrounding interviews. So what should you do to prep for an interview? And then more specifically, um, how do you put your best foot forward with virtual and video interviews? Yeah. Um, well, I feel like I almost want to jump to that one first. So just just kind of thinking about that virtual piece because all interviews are <laughs> virtual. I think one of the first things is you almost want to just treat it like an actual interview, you know, get dressed up like you're going to go to the company, um, set the time aside, put your phone on silent, have your water ready, just get everything kind of situated on your side. Um, especially as we've all been working from home for over a year now. I don't know. I, I sometimes hear about people joking about wearing pajama pants on the bottom and a suit on top. I, I don't know, get dressed, be ready to go. <laughs> um, and technology wise, you wanna make sure you test your computer, your lighting, make sure everything is charged, your sound, um, that can be really crucial. And then um, I would say just have fun with it too. I feel like the, the virtual thing, it can be just a little bit awkward or different at the beginning, but I don't know, just almost forget that you're behind a computer because it really it can be a great way just to get to know potential teammates or just kind of, that fits on both sides. So kind of see if it's the kind of people you might want to be working with and that kind of thing. Um, and also just don't be afraid to show your enthusiasm for the company. I feel like that's one thing that, that may be a little bit tougher in a virtual scenario than if you were in the office and kind of sitting in the conference room or something like that. I feel like when you're sitting at home, I don't know, being able to show that you're excited about the role, the opportunity, you know, I think interviewers really do appreciate that. So um, just want to make sure that that's kind of translated, even though it's a virtual. Um, but beyond that, and I guess like beyond the setup, a lot of the prep, um, I think would be, you know, fairly consistent. You know, you always want to make sure um, you do your research on the company and the role and check out the backgrounds of everyone that you're interviewing with, just kind of get a lay of the land. Um, and then, you know, we always say, uh, pop the company into Google. Is there any recent news? Has there been any, I don't know, new brands acquired or just company in the news? I feel like just being up to date on, on some of that is pretty critical. And um, I know it seems kind of obvious, but sometimes when you're, you know, gearing up for something, you might forget to do that last minute. So uh, make sure you're prepared with that. Um, also on the insight side of things, it's pretty common when you're walking through your background 
for them to ask about maybe specific projects or something like that. So I think having some um, actual, you know, kind of projects in your back pocket that you're really proud of or that you're, you're kind of excited to talk through can be good. Um, and that can be anything. I mean, you may not have time for a ton of detail, but having an idea of, you know, the business problem, the, the, the research you designed, how you approached it, sometimes, you know, walking through something end to end can really show your thought process and, and kind of how you kind of use your research to impact the business or client business and that kind of thing. So having some examples that have, um, you know, outcome that you can talk about can be good. Um, and then, oh, questions. I feel like you definitely want to have some questions for being prepared. Um, so at the, you know, a lot of times at the end, they'll ask if you have any questions. I know sometimes some come up within the conversation, but having some also in your back pocket that you can leverage just in case as needed. And also if you meet with a number of different people, you want to make sure they're kind of different for each interviewer. So um, having an idea of different things to ask, whether it's about the, the position or the team or growth potential or where insight fits within the organization. Those are all kind of good things um, to think about. And we actually wrote um, a blog post not too long ago that has some some other tips too, if anyone's interested in, in the question topic. <laughs> yeah, that's all awesome advice. Um, I would add, because we always tell everyone um, that we work with, uh, don't forget to send thank you notes. Um, you know, email those out to the people that you interviewed with, uh, whether it was virtual or in person. It's uh, very important and could really set you apart. Oh, totally. And that's another thing to, to make sure that you um, customize. So I don't know, say you meet with four people, don't send them all the same thank you. So kind of exactly. tailor it a little bit to the conversation. Or <laughs> that can go a long way. So. Yep, absolutely. All right, we're gonna move on to our next topic, um, which is about career advancement and salaries. Um, so Kit, how do you know when to change your position or change companies? Like when is it time to move on? Yeah, I think I think a lot of times, you know, it kind of varies on, on the person and kind of where you are in your career, but a lot of times I think it's it's all about um, kind of where you are in, in terms of, you know, growth and new challenges and that kind of thing. If you, I don't know, if you look around and you feel like you've been in the role kind of doing the same thing, if you feel like you've kind of mastered a lot of the day to day, I don't know, maybe it is time to look around then. Um, or if you, I don't know, just feel like you're maybe not being as challenged anymore, maybe you're not learning as many new things. Um, it, it could be time to look around and um, one of the best times to look is actually when you don't have to. Um, so I know that can be a little bit counterintuitive if you're happy <laughs> in your job, um, but sometimes, I don't know, say there's a layoff in the organization or something changes internally, then you really need to look. But sometimes keeping an eye on things proactively can be a good a good route because you never know when, when um, maybe a nice next step or a strategic next move in your career might, might pop up. So sometimes the timing um, is a little bit, I guess, not predictable, so. <laughs> All right, yeah, great. And then um, if you have been, you know, say say I've been working on the supplier side, um, how do you transition back to the client side after spending time on the supplier side? Hmm. Yeah, the good thing, um, I think, it kind of depends, I guess, on how long you've been away, but um, the good thing about having client side experience under your belt already, um, I feel like you've already kind of built that. So say you spent 10 years on the client side um, and then you've been on the supplier side for four or five years, no one can take away that client side experience you've already built. So I feel like if you went back to the client side, um, you know, it's kind of like riding a bike. You've, you've already understand what it's like to, to work cross-functionally with different business units and kind of leverage research that way. Um, I think maybe it, it maybe depends a little bit on, I guess, how long you've been away. So say you spent two years on the client side and now you've spent 15 years on the supplier side, that might be a little bit trickier, but I think what I would want to do is just make sure that you um, kind of, you know, showcase that you were on the client side initially and then really um, kind of leverage strategic partnerships. So I don't know, say you've had a number of main clients that you've worked with and so you've maintained long-term relationships with them, you've really served as an extension of their team. Um, that can help show that, you know, even though you aren't in-house still, um, you still kind of maintain those relationships. So. Um, I think the biggest thing is once you have that client site under your belt, it kind of opens up more doors. So um, 
maybe don't spend too, too much time away if you think you might return client side at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, next question is about um, salaries. Uh, again, everyone loves hearing about salaries. Um, <laughs> the, the hiring market is is clearly, you know, recovering right now. So it's a pretty hot. And are companies offering higher salaries to help with recruitment? Or are you seeing um, more interest than there are open roles? Like what's the salary trend that you're seeing right now? That's a good question too. And we're also just keeping a pulse on that. I feel like it's one of those things, it's almost, too early to say. Um, I think where last, I guess 2020, you know, some people actually had to take some steps back in salary. We saw some people go on furlough or it was just such a rocky year for so many different companies. Um, I think a lot of that has rebounded and I, I'm anticipating that we'll see something, you know, fairly consistent in next year's data. So, you know, our salary study that we put out last fall was kind of partial pre-pandemic and partial mid-pandemic. Um, so I think we'll have a better read in this year's study. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of middle of the road. I would say salaries from my perspective seem pretty consistent right now. You know, I don't see um, them skyrocketing to get good talent because it's still a pretty competitive market. Um, but I don't see companies kind of lowballing. So I feel like if anything, they, they seem to be pretty consistent and we're seeing strong offers. So I don't know if that answers, but <laughs> at least gives you an idea. So not not uh, skyrocketing, but not going down either. I guess that's good news. Yeah, I mean, we're keeping a pulse on it. So we'll have the data <laughs> coming yep. out in a couple months. But Absolutely. anecdotally, that's what I'd say. All right. Well, we're going to uh, move on to the last section of questions that we have, and then we'll have our live Q&A um, to talk about the hiring market and trends, which we've uh, kind of already started, it sounds like. Um, but let's talk about industry. Which industries are seeing the biggest need for market research and insights professionals? Yeah, that's interesting, too. And, you know, I would say, especially kind of where we are in the pandemic, I feel like almost all companies and industries, I feel like it should be a focus of theirs because I feel like the consumer mind, mindset has changed a ton. Like we've all been through a lot in the past year. Um, what we're seeing though, and I feel like with last year in 2020, you know, it was really especially tough with some areas like travel and hospitality, you know, everything was, everyone was grounded. So I think a lot of those companies did need to, um, you know, kind of furlough or cut back teams. Um, but we're starting to see some of them rehire in a way. So I think that's encouraging, but they're maybe staying about the same. Um, where we're seeing the biggest need or kind of the most movement on our side um, would probably, you know, tech and pharma were both very, I would say, like safe, safe and stable during, during the pandemic with the areas that they played. Um, streaming services, online entertainment, you know, some of those areas did really well. And I feel like we're continuing to see that. Um, and then kind of in the middle would be like retail and restaurants, some of those areas. I feel like, you know, we've gotten calls from a couple of companies where I feel like, you know, they're starting to pick up again, but um, maybe not quite as strong as like tech, pharma, entertainment. Um, and then CPG is, is still doing pretty well. So um, I guess high level. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the other uh, question that I think is on everybody's mind right now is um, work from home. Um, so now that we've all been working from home, um, are more companies, are you seeing more companies open to remote workers? And um, if so, is there certain roles that you're seeing that are more likely to offer that remote flexibility? Yeah, and this one's interesting. I get this question like 10, <laughs> 10 times a day, I feel like. So it's interesting. Um, I feel like if you would have asked me three months ago, I maybe would have had a different answer. I feel like, you know, when we were mid pandemic, you know, remote, there was a little bit more flexibility, but a lot of companies were almost hesitant to um, commit to that. So I feel like there have been some exceptions. I know the tech space, they're kind of leaning into the remote, um, you know, like Spotify and Twitter, and there's companies that are embracing kind of long term remote plans. Um, Beyond that, I think a lot of companies are hesitant to commit to long-term remote, but what we're seeing is kind of a hybrid setup where um, everyone, I think a lot of companies are still working from home now, but they do want someone who can potentially be in the office at least a few days a week or for important meetings and that kind of thing. 
So what we're not seeing is a ton of companies all of a sudden saying, you know what, we can hire someone from anywhere across the whole U.S. and it's just totally open. What we're seeing is, okay, we may be open to someone working remotely in a hybrid setup, but we need them to be in the vicinity. So if you're in Chicago, maybe you need to be at least an hour and a half away from the office to come in a couple days a week or that kind of thing. So, and who knows, I feel like it is kind of an evolving conversation still, but um, initially that's what we're seeing. Um, and what was the other question about the remote flexibility? Oh, yeah, certain there's certain companies. roles, like certain positions, um, maybe based on seniority or industry or function, you know, whatever um, that might be that are more likely to offer that remote flexibility. I think I think we're seeing a little more flexibility on the supplier side of things. I think a lot of times, you know, when you are working with a number of different clients and categories and, you know, your clients could be based all over the U.S., it's a, maybe a little bit less um, imperative that you can be in the office regularly. So it, that's where we're seeing probably the most flexibility is on those supplier side roles. Um, on the client side, it's just, I don't know, I feel like the hesitation is because a lot of these, you know, if you're an in-house researcher, you're working with different departments and you kind of need that face time. I know when it's safe and um, once we have vaccines and are back in the office, but you know, a lot of times researchers might be meeting with marketing one day or R&D or understanding product development or sales. You know, it is kind of important to build those internal relationships within the organization. So I think that's why a lot of um, client side companies are maybe less likely to go that route, but we'll see. I feel like it is kind of an evolving, evolving conversation. Yeah, it's definitely the question everybody is asking and not everybody has a good answer for yet. So we'll we'll keep you posted on what we hear. That's for sure. All right. And now we're going to move on to the live Q&A portion. You guys have sent so many questions. I feel like we could do a whole nother hour, but we actually only have a few more minutes. Um, so just a couple <laughs> of extra questions here. Um, so back to the cop topic, I guess, of, um, you know, kind of career transitions. Um, what's the best way to return to an insights career after moving to other functional areas like marketing or product or business management? Hmm. Okay. Um, well, and I know it, I think insights can kind of be like a launching pad to a lot of different areas. So we do see people go to, I don't know, brand management or marketing. Um, I think it's kind of a one of those things too. How long have you been away? Um, I think if you have two years of insights experience and then you've spent 20 years on traditional marketing, it could be a little bit tricky. But I've also seen people kind of go back and forth. Or maybe um, you know they have a nice client side insights role and then they might transition to a new company within marketing, but then join the insights team later on. So I feel like it's fairly common. I think it's more. Um, you know, pay attention to how long you stay away from insights. And then I guess the thing is, if you are um, not on the insights team, but want to return, I don't know, are you still involved? Are you on the marketing team and you're still, you know, kind of have a hand in some of the research that is being done or attending focus groups and that kind of thing. I feel like having um, almost like keeping a toe in insights can help make that transition back um, a little bit easier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then do you have any advice for anybody looking to work on a consulting or a project basis? Um, for example, somebody doesn't want to work full time anymore, so is looking for more independent work. Yeah, that's a good question too. And I think you know I've seen people you know go from full time work to being really successful on like a consulting, a kind of project based work um, down the line. And I think a lot of times it comes down to really leveraging your network um so whether you are client side and have you know internal partners that you worked with keeping those relationships up so when they have a need i don't know maybe they hire you and instead of an ipsos or something like that um i've also seen people um on the flip side if you're on the supplier side you know you probably worked with a number of different clients and different companies and that kind of thing um maintaining those relationships long term i feel like can be a really great way um, just to, to kind of have those conversations. And um, if nothing else, you can always kind of ping your network and let them know that you are consulting or picking up project work. And, um, you know, I feel like this could be kind of a good time just as, as companies are ramping up and maybe more money um, can be dedicated to research and insights again after 2020 was kind of a year of question for companies in a lot of areas. But I feel like, you know, we're seeing budgets um, 
pretty healthy right now. So I feel like it's a good time just in terms of maybe making those connections or reconnecting with people from the past um, in terms of uh, picking up consulting work. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's going to be our last question for the day so that we can uh, close everything out uh, before the end of the hour. But thank you so much, Kit, for all of that information. Um, I, you did a great job, very comprehensive, I think. And thank you, everybody who joined us. I hope you found it useful. And thank you, especially to those who submitted questions. Um, obviously, we had a ton, so um, we really appreciate the, the participation. And hopefully, you'll all stay in touch. Um, and now, if you are interested in a little bit more data, um, don't forget we have our salary report. Um, it breaks down salaries by quartiles, means, medians, um, and examines salaries by demographic factors like industry, gender, region, and more. Um, and this, uh, in 2020, we included our analysis on the COVID-19 impacts uh, and to the research community and developing hiring trends. You can download it for free at birchworks.com slash study. Um, and of course, if you're looking to add to your marketing research or consumer insight staff, we'd be happy to speak with you and do some brainstorming about what you might have planned in terms of hiring before the end of the year or to start off 2022. We offer contingency, retained, and contract services from research analysts all the way up to chief research officer. So feel free to send us an email if you'd like to chat. That's info at birchworks.com. And throughout the year, be sure to check out our blog at birchworks.com slash blog, uh, where our recruiters post hiring market insights and other information specifically related to marketing research and consumer insights, uh, including resume guides, how to evaluate opportunities, chips for writing job descriptions, and a lot more. Uh, and you can also follow Birchworks across our social media channels to stay up to date on our latest research. And finally, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Birchworks, you can find recordings of our other presentations, including analysis of our research and insights trends survey and career planning resources just for researchers, as well as our series with executive leadership coach, Tim Ressmeyer, with topics including making successful career transitions and how you can take care charge of your own onboarding in a new role. And this presentation will be posted there as well. And if you'd like to discuss your hiring plans or see if we have roles that are a fit for your experience, you can email info at birchworks.com to start the process. Thanks again for joining us, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.